love people that are unconventional. People who rise up against the expectations or the standards of their time. I have a soft place in my heart, especially for unconventional women, because let's be honest, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for unconventional women. Women like Susan B. Anthony, who lived her life fighting for women to have the right to vote, despite living in a world that said a woman's voice doesn't matter. And thanks to her unconventional ways that a woman's voice does matter just as much as a man's, women now have the right to vote in this country, something most of us don't take lightly. Rosa Parks, who refused to give up a bus seat at the front of the bus, she certainly defied convention, and she has become a symbol of the civil rights movement and ultimately contributed to the equality of persons despite the color of their skin. Women like Malala Yousafzai, who survived being shot in the head by the Taliban because she stood up for the right of girls to be educated in her native country, Pakistan. And now she leads a worldwide movement of the importance of educating women today. Yes, I have a soft place in my heart for unconventional women. I like that they are not bound by the social norms of their day. I like that they break boundaries and pave the way for all men and women who come behind them. And if we have learned anything in our years of worship and study and prayer, it is that things that are unconventional often come out of our scriptures. And today is no exception. Placed near the beginning of Mark's gospel, we find this healing story, this miracle, if you will. We are only 28 verses into that very first chapter in the gospel of Mark. And Jesus has already been baptized, tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and already called his first disciples. Only 28 verses into this gospel. And it is obvious that Mark wants us to know Jesus is all about action. Now Jesus and the disciples were coming from the synagogue. The disciples and Jesus stop over at the disciple Simon's house where they find Simon's mother-in-law sick with a fever. Now, fevers in biblical times were a little bit different than they are today. They were considered a sign of demonic possession, and any fever, because of the lack of medical care, would often be fatal. Conventional wisdom said that persons should stay away, completely out of any house where fever was present. But Jesus was, well unconventional. Hearing about Simon's mother-in-law, he does not pause. He goes directly into her, and he touches her, and he heals her. There is no long dialogue. There is no lengthy exam. There's no mask on his face, no fancy words, no actions, other than he simply lifts her hand, and miraculously, her fever is gone. I can only imagine what the disciples were thinking as they witnessed all of this. Now, they had probably seen people attempt healings before because that happened often back then, although not very successfully. But never had anyone healed on the Sabbath before, the time each week that Jews hold holy, and out of respect for that holiness, they don't work from Friday evening at sundown to Saturday at sundown. Jesus had just come from the synagogue where he had already healed another person, much to the dismay of those authorities. His healing act certainly caused many to stop and wonder, just who does this man think he is, breaking the ancient codes and rituals and practices of our Jewish community? I'm sure it left the disciples unnerved because Jesus' actions were, well, unconventional. And Simon's mother-in-law's response, well, it's equally unconventional, for she gets up immediately after Jesus touches her and starts serving. Now, have you ever had a fever that has lasted several days, like maybe the flu or pneumonia? 
I don't know about you, but for me, it exhausts your whole, my whole body, and it takes days and sometimes even weeks to regain some of your strength. And the last thing I feel like doing is getting up and serving other people. Yet Simon's mother-in-law is in the bed burning up with fever in the beginning of the verse and up serving Jesus and others by the end. The gospel writer Mark wants us to make sure that we understand this woman is completely healed. Not just getting up to work because she's feeling a little bit better and because she knows that, well, if I don't do it, no one else will. No, her health is completely restored, and her immediate response to that healing is to serve Jesus and others. Now, some commentators kind of dismiss this healing of Simon's mother-in-law, simply saying, well, Jesus just needed her to get back and do the things she was supposed to do in the household. For as the eldest woman, her role when not sick would be to have serve all of the guests that gathered in her home. So some commentators say, well, she was just doing her job. But I disagree. Something has definitely changed. You see, the gospel writer Mark is using a word for serve here, serving others, that he also has used 20 verses earlier when describing the way that the angels cared for Jesus when he was in the wilderness enduring Satan's temptations. We understand that time as a deep, all-encompassing love that grows out of the knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's been sent to do, and that the angel's love is rooted in that gratitude for who Jesus is and what he's about to do. By using the same understanding, by using this word that has that same understanding of serving, Mark is equating the mother-in-law's actions with those of the angel. Using this same word clues the reader in that Simon's mother-in-law gets exactly who Jesus is. She gets what the angels knew, that Jesus is different. She's not serving Jesus and her guests because conviction dictates that's what you do to the men in your household. She's serving because she knows who Jesus is and that he has come to serve others and to give his life for all. She knows and understands the call to mutual service that rests at the very heart of Jesus' ministry. She is responding with service that reflects the love and care that is and will be shown through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Her response is showing that Jesus, her unconventional gratitude, by serving others in the same unconventional way that she is shown love by him. Her service isn't prescribed or required. It is organic. It grows naturally out of the desire to care for that which is directly before her, simply because she has been loved by God. And that is unconventional. Because anyone can serve out of obligation. You can serve to pay back a favor that has been done or as something that's been mandated by law. But Christ calls us to a different type of love. Christ calls us to love our enemies as not because of what they've done or not done, but because they are loved by Christ. When we love one another, we serve one another as an outgrowth of that love that God has for us. And when we do that, when we are able to look beyond what the world calls for and trumpet with what Jesus calls for, that, my friends, is what we refer to as a miracle. Convention says that we don't have to love those who hurt us, that we only have to love those who love us in return. Convention says that we should do good for others, but only when it's convenient to do so. Convention says that we care for and serve those whom we love, but we don't have to care for those who we don't like. Convention says that we look out for ourselves first and only, only worry about others if we have the time or the energy or maybe the extra money to do so. But friends, Jesus calls us to be unconventional and to walk to the beat of a different drum, 
Jesus calls us to respond to the situations that are right in front of us and with lives given in mutual service for one another. There's a great story that comes from the early 70s. It's about Mississippi Democratic Senator John Stennis, who was on his way home after a particularly lengthy and grueling day on Capitol Hill. After parking his car and he began to walk to his door, two people came out of the darkness and they robbed him and shot him twice. News of the shooting of Senator Stennis who then was the chairman of the powerful Armed Forces Committee, shocked Washington and the nation, and it was reported that he was in critical condition at Walter Reed Hospital. Upon hearing the news, another politician who was driving home turned his car around and drove directly to the hospital. He too had been a part of that particularly grueling day, but when he got to the hospital, he noticed that the staff was swamped and they could not keep up with all of the phone calls coming in about the senator's condition. So he spotted an unintended telephone, sat down, and voluntarily went to work. He continued taking calls all night long until the daylight. <clears throat> Sometime during that next day, he stood up, he stretched, and he put his coat on and leaned over to the operator next to him, thanking her for her service. And then Oregon Senator Mark Hatfield, a very conservative Republican whose views clashed often with Senator Stennis, unobtrusively got up and went home. I know a young woman named Alyssa. As her fifth birthday was approaching, her mother asked her what she wanted to do on her birthday and expecting to hear about ponies and carnival rides, Alyssa told her mom, I want to go to the store and I want to buy food for those homeless persons who live downtown. Her mother teared up and said, of course we can do that. And as her birthday continued to approach, her mother asked again, thinking she would have changed her mind. But Alyssa said, oh yes, I want to add something. I want to make cookies. And then I want to take them down to the homeless community and I want to hand them out. Unbelievably shocked, her mother said, yeah, we can do that. And on the day Alyssa turned five, she and her mother baked and decorated several dozen birthday cookies and took them along with many cans and jars of food that they had so carefully selected when they shopped and they went down to an agency near a bridge downtown. Then, with an advocate of that agency, they went out and offered cookies to a hesitantly suspicious homeless community that resided under a local bridge. It took a while, but when the people realized that this child had baked these cookies just for them, they came in droves, smiling and thankful for the dignity and respect shown to them through the actions of a small child. I'm sure I could stand up here and share hundreds of stories, true stories, mind you, of faithful people and the ways that they serve, all of them poignant and inspiring, and you too might have some of your own. And all of them are unconventional and miraculous in that they are not done out of duty because someone told them this is what we're going to do but done out of unconditional, selfless, grace-filled love. Tomorrow, our country celebrates the birthday of a man who devoted his life to the mutual service of God and led a whole nation out of the understanding that God's unconditional, grace-filled love was for each and every person, regardless of color. Dr. King was an unconventional leader in that he led the civil rights movement, calling people to fight against injustice using methods of peaceful resistance, even in spite of all of the hateful violence that was being thrown at him again and again and again. In his adapted sermon, The Drum Major Instinct, delivered just one month before his assassination, he preached these words, preaching to those who claimed it was easy for him to practice what he was preaching because 
He was a Nobel Prize winner. He was a preacher. But this is what he said. Everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't even have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. And you don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You need only a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can serve. Friends, we have the opportunity to love the God who is so very radical, so very unconventional that God sent a son, God's very own son, to live and to die and to be resurrected so that each one of us could live. A God that loves us so very deeply that God desires for us to love each other over and above anything else that the world throws at us. We have the opportunity every day to live out our thanks to God simply by serving God's people. A heart full of grace? Yeah, we got that. A soul generated by love? You bet you have that. Can we do this? Yeah, I think we can. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.